you know, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, my, my Episcopalian friends last night. I did not mention, I told you that there were two Episcopal churches in Santa Barbara, but actually there's a third out near the campus, the UC Santa Barbara campus, St. Michael's uh, Episcopal Church. And right now, uh, I can't be there, but, but tomorrow night, there is a meeting of community leaders that I was invited to, because St. Michael's has been vandalized uh, several times over the past few weeks. The vandalism began when their church began to put a sign in front of their church, Black Lives Matter. And so windows started being broken. And uh, what's, what's kind of discouraging about this, I think, for a lot of people, is that this is a college community. Uh, this is not, you know, some, you know, some person who grew up in Tennessee uh, being groomed his whole life to hate uh, black people. Um, so this is discouraging for a lot of people. But we refuse to, to lose heart. And, you know, we know we have allies like, like the congregation um, at St. Michael's and other congregations in town, and not just Christian congregations. And uh, I think it was how, last night, who asked the question, was it Ian? Somebody asked the question, what positive, what hope do I see? Nate? Uh, was mm -hmm. that Nate? It was Nate, yeah, because he's sitting right back there. Uh, Nate asked that, that question, and, and really, uh, there, is a, there is a new community emerging out of this sense of being tired of and fed up. Um, but it is a community of compassion. It's a community of patience, a community of gentleness. But as I mentioned last night, it is a, com it is a community uh, that has a self-assurance about itself and a security about itself that my parents' generation may not have had. And what I mean by that is I said that the marches of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s were characterized by quietness and hymn singing. But the marches today have chants and cheering and lots of noise. And you know when they're coming. You can hear it from a long ways away. And um, there are more people who are, uh, there's a larger uh, youth constituency. It's really largely youth driven. And um, I feed off of their enthusiasm and energy. And honestly, when, uh, you know, when we're out marching, and sometimes they'll want to sit down in the middle of the street, it's like, well, you know, it's easy for you to say, but I got to get back up when we can, <laughs> you know, yeah. we'll sit there for 20 minutes on the, on the asphalt. So uh, then I kind of have become the default leader because I'm standing, so they hand me the <laughs> megaphone. Cause, okay, you guys ready to go? Um, <laughs> but I, I appreciate their enthusiasm and, and, I, uh, and their willingness to engage people who are from different backgrounds. It's such a blessing. It's a joy to see that happening. And I think that's a, a wonderful development that we can feed off of. And, and the, you know, I asked the question, can we, can we fix this? Uh, and these responses are affirming to me because what they're saying that, yes, it can be fixed because there are people with a different mentality who, who exist. And those people need solidarity. And um, it took a crisis or a series of crises for us to come to this place of solidarity and communication. And um, maybe one of the reasons that we don't have it more is that we have not, uh, we have not experienced uh, enough crisis. We're not ex you know, where it touches us directly. Does that make sense to, you know, it's like, well, what can I do? I mean, it's not like people are, you know, have ill will or anything. It's like people feel powerless, like, what can I do? Well, it come, there, there can come a moment where it's not, what can I do? It's, I have to do something. So how do you approach that moment? I think a lot of the, the stuff you've been referring to lately has to do with that relationship between things like fear and trust and risk-taking and vulnerability and those kinds of things. Like the, the guy at the college 
probably has a largely good heart, but is afraid of what will happen for a number of reasons. You know, he, does, he doesn't want it to be out of his control. He wants to control every step of it. It's hard for him to to trust, you know, where that will go. And I think there's a lot of that around. Yeah. You know what Catch them while they're young, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like uh, child evangelism. Yeah. <laughs> 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 teach them all about love each other. Yeah. You do. It's, it's a learned behavior from somebody else. Because mm -hmm. you can see little kids, they know no color, nothing. Mm -hmm. It's kids playing. So you get an adult who goes, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they change. Child. Karen? This is a little off topic. But, um, I became a widow in, in uh, 1999. I've been 20 years in my church, primarily my church. And uh, I had served in just about every department in Edinburgh to preach, you know, midweek service and and uh, had a prayer meeting every Sunday night for seven and a half years and did children's ministry everything. But the minute I changed and became a widow, everything changed. We had a, a ladies brunch going to happen at the Sheridan and uh, this was about two weeks after my husband died. And I thought, you know what, this would be really good for me just to get out with the other ladies and just enjoy a good time together. The minute I got in the door, I was met by the president of our WN, Women's Ministries, and told, you're no longer married. You're not one of us married ladies. So you don't really have anything in common with us anymore. So we're going to put you over here, like at the other end of the room. You can sit with Lucy. She's divorced, and you two will have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> now, now, Lucy and I sat there, and we kind of laughed. Because we thought, oh, where are they from? <laughs> you know? I didn't choose Lucy. <laughs> 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 but anyway, I had a little optical shop that I about nine years in, in a medical center, and uh, this was probably just a month after he died. I had two women from the church come right in, you know, arms linked, and they told me, um, you know what we think? Uh, we think it might be wise for you to just stay home for a couple of years. <laughs> now, they didn't mean don't work, but just stay out of the church, because it's not really fair that... Um, we should have to engage in this burden. So if you stay home and you get over this, then you can come back and everything will be much better. You and Because we feel you have to work through this. Yeah. And of course, I tore a strip right off. <laughs> 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 Told them to hit the road, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I, I couldn't, and of course, there were many other instances, but I, I couldn't believe white church, you know, um, I had served faithfully for 20 years. My husband was the pianist and, and adult Bible study teacher, very involved. And yet the minute there was change, and from all that, what I what I felt was that uh, they didn't want the burden. Yeah. They, they didn't want it. And I was sharing with Peter uh, the other night, because I was so involved in prayer, we had these all night prayer meetings and you know, um, Pentecostals, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, there was one particular night, uh, the presence of God was just saturating the whole place, and we were just dripping on it, and, and I went to work the next morning in my lab coat, and I, I mean, the presence of God was just so insanely rich, I could hardly do my job, and about four in the afternoon, I said, okay, God, enough, you know, like, what, what's this really doing? I feel great, but, but... I need a word for the church, you know, like, so just give me something for the church, and I'll feel like this was all fruitful, and he said, come out of your comfort zone, and be separated unto me, 
And, and you know, I think that the biggest problem, or maybe the greatest solution, is a return to Christ. I think that it's only in Christ when we realize we're, we all stand on level ground before the cross. Black, white, disabled, widow, you name it. Gay, lesbian, it doesn't matter. We're all on level ground before the cross. And I think it's this return to Christ that abolishes exclusion, it, it abolishes racism, and ageism, and everything. Well, I'm really, I'm really sorry that you had to you know, go through all of that. You had to deal with that. But there, see, that that erupted in my work on exclusion. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I just I don't I have no idea what the answer to this is, but I just wanted to ask: um, Would something like that have happened to you if you were a widower? Oh, definitely not. Okay. The, the minute a man would lose his wife, there's ten other women. <laughs> <laughs> You're on, you're on point there. I, 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 it is, it is socioeconomic. Anybody want to mention? Can anybody encapsulate what, how, how we broached that last night? The green problem. <laughs> oh yeah, that was one example. Yeah, I said the, the problem that that minorities are having with police is not a blue problem. It's a green problem. You know, money. And there's something else because I think Walter, uh, you had some observations. But I mean the. The question I had, which was a new question listening to you, was how tied together, how much we have to, or people feel like they have to maintain some of these inequalities here in order to justify the bigger economic system that exploits people around the world. Mm -hmm. So if, if, we're, if we were equal here, how do we, how do we not ruin that whole system? <laughs> yeah. You know, which, which would be great, is what I'm... I mean, it would be great to ruin the whole system. Yeah, and, and, and people who are barely hanging on are constantly being told that you won't be able to hang on uh, if the people who aren't hanging on um, somehow advance. Uh, that the only way that you can maintain your security, whatever semblance of security that is, the only way that you can maintain it is, is, is you got to keep it from being threatened by those who, who have nothing. When that's really not the, the the picture, but that's a picture that's being painted for us. I mean, one of the things we've been talking about in class is how the hardest people to um, convince that racism is happening is the lower socioeconomic classes because they feel like they're suffering, mm -hmm. and so they don't see how um, other people can be suffering when they themselves are struggling so much. You know. Yeah. Hey, um, yeah, like to add to that too, and to go back to what was said by me yesterday about it's really hard to feel included in a movement if you're a white girl, especially with African American girls. Um, and I worked and lived in the North and Halifax for a long time, and the only, I think what got me through, and I was thinking about it last night after you said that, with being able to bond with the people in the North End was they were my customers, and they were like, wow, she's you know, her life isn't easy, she's working really hard, she's working the same kind of jobs we are. And so I was kind of welcomed in to, uh, because I shared some of their burdens. And uh, I think you have an even more complex problem when you work in the problems of being female and the problems of being African American. Yeah. So this is why I pointed out last night, I didn't use this, the term scapegoat, but um, 
The wealth disparity in the states between African American families and white families is 27 to 1. Now that's not the income disparity, but in income doesn't catch you up generationally. When we're talking about inheritances and you know, and properties, homeowners uh, compared to renters and all these kind of things. So the wealth disparity is 27 to 1. So there can be people who look like they're in similar situations. They live in the same nice neighborhood, but, you know, the f one family has two summer houses, uh, you know, one in the south of France and the other one is just barely paying the mortgage on the one place. Well, if you take that down a couple of notches socioeconomically, uh, some people are not surviving. Some people, they're not even thinking about, uh, they don't even know why they would finish high school, much less go to college, because they don't see the point. And so you find these kinds of asphyxi asphyxiating conditions that are, that, that are in communities. But again, it's not that African Americans are, uh, or that racism is uh, the ultimate objective of the powers. And, I, yeah, and if you want to ask me, I do believe in a devil, all right? Maybe not the traditional devil, um, but I believe in Satan. And I believe that there are powers that operate through those who control, people who control systems, and they keep, uh, they keep people feeling insecure where they are because they feel like the people who are the threat are the people beneath them, the people, uh, the, people the jobless, the homeless, uh, they feel like those people, if those people advance in any way, then it's going to cost the rest of us. So what you hear politically in our country all the time, I'm not as familiar with Canada, but in our country, you always hear politicians campaigning and talking about, we need a better, stronger middle, middle class, right? Their, their goal is to empower the middle class, or at least that's their speech making device, the middle class. But we as Christians, our goal is to uplift the poor. But we, we have to decide if we're going to be Christians or if we're going to be Americans in many cases. We're, we have to decide whether we're going to be uh, uh, like Jesus and focus, target the needs of the poor or if we're going to be capitalists and target the needs of those who are hanging on. Yeah. I got a question. Why is it that in America, assuming that most of the people are, the majority of people are either poor or below the, the middle median in, in terms of economics, why is it that they typically vote for a party that would not represent their best interest economically? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, <laughs> yeah. well, I think this is what Re Rebecca was observing a moment ago. Um, it's the same reason that you find the highest degrees of race hate in the poorer states. Um, in places like Kentucky, West Virginia, Mississippi, you find more, you find the presence of the Ku Klux Klan uh, because people are being embittered and they're, t they're basically told in so many words that your problem is these other people. And so there is this vain hope by people who live in these places that if I vote for the guy who champions the white cause, um, if I vote for the guy who uses code words, Donald Trump, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, cre that, that emphasizes an us versus them. If I, if I do, I mean, really, I can attract uh, support this way. And yeah, go ahead, Peter. Uh, no, you finish your point. No, you, you go. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree with this, but I also think, I, I thought about this a lot, because I found it very, as a, as a religious professional, as a, you know, as a Christian scholar and as a pastor, I found it very embarrassing to be a Christian for the last uh, number of years, because of the kinds of things that we see in the news so frequently. But I think also, most deeply, because of this very issue that Bill's talking about, because I think that, that, uh, that certain power blocks in society co-opt the religious world, uh, I think use the religious world by using hot button moral issues that somehow touch the sensibilities of the religious people, but they don't understand that they're actually co-opting them into uh, a concern that goes directly against the concerns of Jesus. 
So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think that the Christian world very, very often, with its best intentions, is actually anti-Christ. Yeah. It's, my, it's my own feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. You just made the lecture. You could have done this. <laughs> 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 Naomi. I, um, I think that uh, in America, patriotism is uh, been a religion and still is a religion. That what? Say that again. Patriotism is a religion, mm. and it um, it sort of uh, uses Christianity as a vehicle to push its own agenda through um, through like cap hyper capitalism and um, econ economics and and through politics um, and to. Uh, I guess what you're saying, using us and them, and polarize um, like uh, white people or middle class people against poor people, sure. and it, it's like the and then there's like you know I don't know like the top one percent or five percent on top just sort of like getting their way because they're like they're like controlling um, the other people that people below don't really notice that they're being controlled. Yeah. So essentially, racism is a tool that is used to perpetuate classism. You know, it's, it, it's really what it comes down to. It's, it's, it's to stigmatize and to scapegoat certain people to make some people feel good about their own poverty, essentially. It makes, you know, if, if my log cabin is better than your outhouse, then, then you know, that I'm happy. When there's so much more available, uh, for all of us, but we're threatened. I mean, it's it's not realistic. You as Canadians probably see this way better than I do, but if we let certain people have health care coverage, then that's going to threaten our whole system. Like, we'll all get sick and we won't be able to go to doctors. I mean, this is the kind of thing that they were saying. We, we won't have access, none of us will have access to medical care and, and you know, all kinds of strange, irrational things, uh, claims were made. Well, that's bad that all the, the record on gun, on gun violence and gun control. I mean, some of the stuff doesn't even make any sense that's on there. Well, that's the thing. It's not necessarily supposed to make sense. No, I don't. <laughs> it just needs to be religious. Something that's just right down ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, David? Yeah. You near time for a break. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's do let's do our break and then uh, we won't have a long period after this because I'm going to meet with the, the class uh, aside from everybody. But um, I want to move towards what it means to 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 have a calm soul in the face of all of these things. And before I do that, I need to really make graphic how uh, how stark our situation is particularly in the States, okay? So, um, take what, 10 minutes, is that good? Oh, uh, well, there's a co coffee in the carafe, if anyone wants some. Yeah, there's coffee and tea and a kettle in there if you'd like to go in and have some treats and uh, enjoy it.